blind I am, who was once far in sight, and swift in malice, cursed and punished to recount not mine own glory, and mine own tragedies, but the glorious and terrible sagas of others, who have borne the blood blade of champion before the great gods of chaos. It is I, their chronicler, it is I alone who may tell their tales, spilling their secrets with my viper's tongue and burning venom ink. For those with the wisdom to see and the wit to tell steel-edged truth from honey lie. Beware, for such knowledge is as treacherous as the path to greatness in service of chaos itself. Know, then, that this is the saga of Tamakan. Maggot Lord, son of the great Kurgan of old, favoured of Nurgle, warlord, tyrant, cankerworm and false king, Tamakan the Great, Tamakan the Fool, pawn of prophecy and bringer of slaughter. The history of Tamakan began to the far north, as all such sagas of chaos often begin. In the year of the crow, in the sixth reign of the black moon by Norsken reckoning, the never-ending tempest that crowns the storm that is known to men as the realm of chaos, waxed gibbous and grasping. All across the Northlands the earth shifted and moaned, as if it were a sleeper beset by nightmares. Battle graves vomited forth their unquiet dead, and she-beast and mortal woman alike were greatly blessed with the taint of chaos in their birthings. All men knew what a time of great portents was at hand, and rumours spread like grassland fires of sundered prisons and baleful visitations, of great monsters bestirred from their slumbers in the caves and mires of the wastes, and of sorceresses leaping eager into the minds of those with the wit to seize them. War was coming, as it had countless times before, and would do so countless times again. Red war, the likes of which every Northman, be they Dolgan, Chian, or Karzak, feels the calling of in their bones and cannot resist. War at the pleasure of the Chaos Gods. With the call to battle tugging at their minds and souls, some wasted no time in falling first upon their own striving in bloody combat to prove their worth before their tribe and their gods for the battles to come. Others, tormented by dreams and visions, quested alone, travelling ever northward to where the world itself was ripped apart. Of these dark pilgrims, some found paths to bleak and nightmarish shrines where they came to claim a blessing and pledge their allegiance to one of the great powers while well, many merely found death. Feeling the breath of chaos at their necks, and hearing its honeyed whispers of promises of their ascendancy and destruction in equal measure, many exalted champions and would-be warlords across the Northlands bestirred themselves for battle. For some, the prospect of fighting familiar foes and settling ancient feuds was enough to call on their savagery and spur them into action alone, while others, superstitious and pious in their dark religion, sought the favour of the gods by divining prophecies in the calling of demonic summonings for law and guidance as to where their blow should fall. Fickle and contradictory are the gods of chaos, and treacherous their demon kin. For each visitation an augury was a different answer given, and for each a different path to glory illuminated. Yet within this cacophony of maddening lies, lickspittle truths and burning secrets, there were names and whispers that reverberated and echoed time and again to some, of the ever-chosen yet to rise, of Zan Beijin, the fallen city, the serpent's moon and the dead grail, of the kingdom of fire and ash, and of the throne of chaos, of undying dominion over the mortal world in demon's flesh, a prize ripe for the taking. 
So it came to pass in the Kurgan lands, where the legend of the blasted plateau of Kadatha and the ancient ruins of Zanbejin that surmounted it were well known, that many warlords and mighty champions of chaos were drawn to quest for its cold heights. Although said to exist somewhere to the east, the Kadatha was known to shift and wane like a mirage on the horizon and an unfavoured warrior might be driven mad or starve without ever reaching it, though it hovered on the horizon before them. But as the realm of chaos waxed in power, the great plateau of blasted Kadatha lay open for any that would dare climb the razor-sharp rocks of its passes to give battle in the shadow of the ancient ruins. The great host of Tamakan, the Maggot Lord, set forth with the baleful lights of the realm of chaos waxing above them, casting down their sickly and babulous radiance on those below. Under this unhallowed light, many were stricken with visions, and others were blessed with the touch of insanity by the dark god's revelations. Men and beast fell and were changed, their bodies contorting and mutating anew to shapes more pleasing to their masters, and those around them rejoiced, letting out great howls of triumph, for surely by this omen was their cause blessed. Zanbejin, the fallen city, was older than men, and had long served as an arena where the Chaos Gods watched their mortal followers vie for their favour in violent conflict. When the champions and their armies came to battle here, each one hoped to prove their worth and the superiority of their patron over all others. A champion who was a victor would be marked for greatness, and by ancient tradition became master of those they vanquished. The fame of such a warlord would spread throughout the northern wastes, and many would flock to their banner, seeing a promise of glories to come. Eventually, Three mighty armies came to make war in the shadow of the timeless twisted pillars of Zanbejin. First from the west came the brazen-armoured warriors of Hacker the Aisling, his axemen drawn up in brutal column, each accompanied by packs of blood-crazed gore-spawn and flayed hounds snapping at their leashes. From the east came Sargath the Vain, horse-lord of the Yurtsak, at whose bequest the paramours of Slanesh had driven themselves up to his service. From the south came the witch cabal of Urak Solbane, arch-sorcerer and demon priest, at whose beckoning the earth and rocks themselves spat forth twisted killing shapes, and above whose head vultures whirled on wings of flame. Although comparably few compared to the other greater forces the witch cult was ready, and its fanatic acolytes and sorcerers could match many times their own numbers in combat. Soon battle was joined, and the slaughter was great. By spell and sword, fanged moor and burning talon, lives were claimed and blood was shed in profusion for the gods' pleasure. The dead plazas of the fallen city echoed once more to the song of steel and the piteous cries of the dying. Hour after hour, day after day, the forces clashed and parted in the heartbeat rhythm of war. Of the three forces, none gained the upper hand, for while the fury of hackers' berserkers was unsurpassed, it was countered by the numbers of Sargath's vast host, who spitted themselves on their foes' blades with unholy bliss and dragged them down, only to be beaten back from victory in turn by the scouring hellfire of Urak, striking when triumph seemed assured. Each force grew more desperate for victory as the bodies stacked deep in the cold dust and moons passed overhead, and a great tumult of baleful light caught hold in the skies above Kadatha both as a sign of the god's pleasure and as a beacon to draw others to the promise of glory like moths to a flame. The fighting ran on unabated, 
and soon where thousands had battled before, tens of thousands now flocked to join the conflict, swelling the armies of the mighty champions with scores of Chaos Warlords, hungering monstrosities and Chaos Warriors beyond number. When the moon of Mansleep died in the east, and the black moon Morsleep rose in ascendancy, another host appeared on the horizon, carrying with it a great miasma of shadow and pestilence. It had begun as a flood of distorted, nightmarish things, dredged up from the depths of cold mires, hungering bile trolls, worm men, and hideous nameless things, dripping rotten slime. At the head of this monstrous horde was a rotted yet living cadaver astride a mighty toad dragon, a cadaver that called itself Tamakan the Maggot Lord, servant of the god of pestilence and father of all diseases. Nurgle. Like the other Chaos Warlords, Tamakan had been drawn to Kadatha by the promises of power beyond mortal imagining. But from the beginning, he amongst the four had been marked for glory by his patron god. As Tamakan had set out from his fitted lair, Nurgle himself had sent forth a dark and noxious storm that howled and screamed before the rancid column of beasts and half-men that he commanded, carrying the certain promise of death and ruin to those who would stop them. Whilst the moon had dwindled in the night sky, the horde of Tamakan wound ever westward, towards the blasted Kadatha where the battle already raged. Drawn in his wake were many fierce warriors who owed fealty to the corrupt father of plagues. Heedless of loyalty to tribe or warband, so highly blessed in Father Nurgle's favour, Tamakan clearly was. From all the domains of the Northlands, champions of decay clamoured to the cavalcade of their new master, and soon names already legend for the desolation they had wrought, such as Kaisak the Befouled, master of an order of corrupt and rotted Chaos Knights, and the dragon rider, Orthbal Vipergut, came to pledge to him their filth-stained blades and allegiance. With every great warrior of renown came also a host of lesser knights, tribesmen and subhuman dregs in profusion. Such was the scale of this gathering that the Northlands were nearly emptied of its inhabitants. Most of those who rallied to the ragged banners of Nurgle were already marked by the favours of their patron lord, and some were so corrupted by disease and disfigurement that they were barely recognisable as human beings. Tamakan's coming to blasted Kadatha was heralded by dark signs and portents, and even as his mouldering host mounted the passes to the plateau, the bodies of the slain that lit had fallen, Jan Beijin, started to shudder and seethe with unholy life. This phenomenon was not the workings of dark necromancy, but of huge bloated carrion flies that had begun to breed and multiply within the organs of the dead and dying. The juddering corpses now burst forth with a hateful biting swarm to darken the skies in sickly clouds and fill the fallen city with their murmurous wingbeats. With this foul omen at hand, the witch cult of Urek Solbane, arcanist of Zench, fled Shanbajin, spitting burning curses as they left, their master having divined of doom, should they decide to stay and fight. For the bitter rivals, Sargath and Hacker, the arrival of this horde did not persuade them to give up the fight, even when the swarms of biting flies began to devour the entire city. So it was that Tamakan's plague-ridden host fell upon the two greater armies, as they were already engaged in bloody battle for the wide plaza at the centre of the dead city. The slaughter was great, and swiftly many of the minor warbands were crushed or driven from the field in disarray. Those not trapped between warring factions or blinded by bloodlust took to flight rather than risk overwhelming destruction. Only Sargath and Hacker's forces fought on unbowed, 
At the height of the battle, the skies were rent open and foul, caustic rain fell in great sheets. At the tainted rain's touch, the flesh of the dead petrified and ran like melting wax, and open wounds festered as the vanguard of the three great warlords met in the battle at the plaza's centre. The proud and vicious steeds of the Yurtzak marauders were soon mired as obscene tendrils of rancid liquid rose up to drown them in a horrific massacre as the horde of Temakan smashed into their flank with shattering force. The embattled combatants turned and counterattacked this new enemy. Sargath's sworn sorcerers responded with twisting enchantments of their own, searing the oncoming plague beasts with waves of coruscating energy, blinding and misleading its warriors with murderous illusions. But all was in vain as the disordered line of Sargath's marauders and cavalry, caught in place and robbed of the advantage of mobility, crumbled before the implacable tide of rot and terror before them, while Sargath's most powerful troops, his mutant forsaken, were caught between the onslaught of Kazakh the Befouled's Chaos Knights on one side, and the frenzied flayed hounds of Hacker's forces, who had been driven utterly insane by the corrosive rain and devouring flies on the other. Seeing the tide of battle turned against him, Sargath, his pride stung and his rage uncontrollable at the prospect of defeat, charged his own bodyguard of Chaos Knights at the heart of Tamakan's forces, calling for the head of one who had so insulted him with the presumption of the attack on Slanesh's favoured son. His white enamelled armour splattered with blood and unmentionable filth, Sargath, whose blade skill was legend, hacked and slew his way to face his new enemy. With his narrow, rune blade slicing through rusted armour and decaying flesh alike, he carved his way to face Tamakan directly. Arrogant and scorning the forces that surrounded him, Sargath, Prince of Chaos, poured insults upon the withered figure that slumped bonelessly atop the vast hulking beast before him. The toe dragon Bubalos was the size of a tower house, its armoured bulk already shredded and scratched with dozens of wounds that had done nothing to stop its rampage. The rotted figure atop the monster spat back his own taunts in reply, and at the slightest gesture of command, Bubalus reared up and opened its vast and reeking maw wide. But even as the toad dragon unleashed a blast of unspeakable foulness from its gaping mouth, the inhumanly lithe Sargath leapt from the back of his cow steed and high into the air. As a mere instant later, his former mount was liquefied into screaming necrotic ooze. Sargath's leap took him to the very head of the beast itself, landing upon one of its horns even as his once white armour became rustled with the backwash of Bubulus's vile breath. With a cry of triumph, Sargath swung himself upwards at the toad dragon's rider, and with the speed of a striking serpent, sunk his rune blade deep into Tamakan's heart. Tamakan merely laughed, and Sargath's howl of triumph was cut short, as the withered cadaver before him squirmed, bulged, and split open like a bloated fruit, and Temakan's true form was revealed. An infant-sized maggot, streaked with greyish slime, leaped into the throat of Sargath and ripped itself deep into his body, the maggot's fatted body writhed and twisted obscenely as it pushed its way behind Sargath's ribcage, which splintered and cracked, the maggot thing devouring and boring ever deeper into the living organs within. The champion of Slanesh's body fell limply to the fitted mire of the battlefield and rose again. Bubulus bellowing in deafening exultation as the servants of decay gibbered and capered in bleak joy as Tamakan, reborn in his latest body, mounted again on his war beast.
I'm so poor by my side